With all the ships in the Star Trek universe, some get more screen time, backstory, and general development than others, especially the ones that belong to pseudo-military organizations such as Starfleet, the Tal Shiar, the Klingon Defense Force, so on and so forth. So with that in mind, we're here today to cover some of those that make up the backbone of the trade routes, and cover some other key civilian ships that have made a noticeable mark on their respective era. Some a little more muddy than others. Huh? Huh? Did you get it? Did you see what I did there? Greetings, lords, ladies, and sovereigns. I am, of course, Lieutenant Commander Dadam. <laughs> and welcome to Trek Central. Before we warp into this video, as always, if you want to keep up to date with the latest Star Trek news, lore, more, and dad jokes, then make sure you hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media for daily updates on the Star Trek universe. Okay, let's fly. Kapla, and greetings, warriors of the Empire. I am General Mustache of the House of Biscuit, and I am here to tell you this video is brought to you by Rage Shadow Legends. You have a phone, don't you? Of course you do! And you should be using it to play Raid Shadow Legends right now! Otherwise, you're missing out on a glorious opportunity! It's free to play, you know. <laughs> One of my favorite aspects of Raid is the unique champions. As such, my favorite has to be Ethos, a high elven legendary champion. He's one of the best campaign farmers, thanks to his powerful area of effect attacks. As such, he is a star in the arena offensive battles. Putting Ethos to use in PvE content in Raid Shadow Legends is fantastic, as he can also clear waves in dungeons, Doom Tower, and even faction wars. A huge new update is landing in Raid this month with tons of new features, a brand new dungeon, and the introduction of Artifact Ascension. Players can battle through the Sand Devil's Necropolis and earn the precious oil needed to take your artifacts to the next level. You can also get into the holiday spirit as new holiday champions are being added. So get ready for the festive spirit of Kalos. Did you know a legendary champion has been added? The Ronda Rousey is here. You can get Ronda for free right now, no matter if you're a new or long time player. Simply log into Raid and play for seven days between now and February 20th. Use the special code RAIDRONDA to get a bunch of cool, helpful items, such as a three-day experience boost, 500,000 silver, and five full energy refills. Also, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can get your exclusive rewards in Raid right now. If you haven't started playing Raid yet, make it so by clicking my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen. You'll get unique bonuses worth $30. A free epic champion, Rector Drath. 200,000 silver, one energy refill, and one experience boost, and one ancient shard. So you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. All of this awesome treasure is awaiting for you here and is available for 30 days for new players. But for now, my glorious message of conquest has been delivered. Enjoy the video, and thanks for listening. Long live the Empire. Now with the usual waffle out of the way, let's start with the visually named Y-Class Freighter. They're operated by the Earth Cargo Service, and they carry the ECX prefix to match, which appears to be interchangeable with the registry. For example, the ECS Fortunate, or ECS 2801. The Y Class was Earth's most common type of cargo transport, operated between the early to mid 22nd century. All Earth cargo service ships were regulated by a governing body known as the Earth Cargo Authority. This agency governed the Earth registered interstellar cargo transport vessels and required them to gain a license to operate, which could be withdrawn if delivery was missed. I'm surprised any had a license at all. But with all the ones that were looted by pirates on their trips, I mean, you might as well just give the license to the pirates, come on. They were roughly 270 meters long, usually crewed by families, armed with phase cannons, and had magnetic grapplers. They are, were, or will be, the space equivalent of freight trains, in that they have several large modules, typically eight, all of which were individually pressurized and detachable, attached to their framework, and hauled to various outposts along their trade routes. 
With a top speed of warp 1.8, the warp nacelles were built at the rear, inward of the cargo pods. It could take a year to cross star systems, and voyages of five years or more were common. Again, to use the Fortunate as an example, Captain Keane's family had been aboard for three generations by 2151. Given that the crews were often generational like this, they were referred to as boomers, a slang term for people that spent their lives on ships running cargo. Which seems a bit of a weird nickname to give to people who did that. I mean, unless they count the amount of times the freighters blew up, I suppose. But did they blow up that much? Eh, who cares. The crew of freighters needed to be self-reliant, as they could often find themselves away from help for weeks, and also vulnerable to attack from pirates after their cargo. Y-classes were only armed with basic phase cannons and some rudimentary hull polarization to defend themselves. Their weapons were often referred to as little more than a pop gun, which is adorable, as they only had a range of 9 kilometers or less, and were primarily designed to blow apart oncoming asteroids or debris in the ship's path. Most freighter captains route their phase cannons directly through the impulse engines, which at least gave it a bit more power and had a better chance of repelling attackers. It also didn't take much to disable these freighters, even with the hulls polarized. It wasn't uncommon to come under attack from Norsican pirates, and the freighters had no hope of outrunning them, and often lost their cargo. Both lives and livelihoods were very often at stake in these ships. A notable ship of the class was the aforementioned ECS Fortunate, which found itself under attack from Norsean pirates. Norsean pirates? Yeah, maybe you've heard of them. They're similar to the Norsicans, except they keep vomiting a lot. Slightly less infamous, but equally bad-tempered. But the Fortunate's weapons were completely useless against them, whoever they were. The design for the Y-Class was started by John Eaves, who seems to be coming as popular as a blade of armor at this point, but was ultimately completed by Ron B. Moore and the VFX team. Legends all. While there are still frequent references to Earth Freighters in the TOS era, they have never actually been seen. Not until a single one popped up in the animated series, but it didn't feature on The Next Generation or on Deep Space Nine. When the script for Fortunate Son called for an Earth cargo ship, well, there wasn't much to go by. The script dictated a lot about the design, making it clear it was supposed to be massive and required one of the pods to be blown off during the episode. Eves had three alternative drawings for the ECS Fortunate, by extension the Y-Class, all of which shared the same basic architecture of a central framework and multiple cargo pods on either side. One of the designs was a cab at the front where the nacelles were attached and essentially worked as a tug. This design was rejected in favor of the other two. Producers understood that the drawings weren't final, and Moore wanted to design the ship for specific shots, such as a shuttle docking to the main cab, so there had to be a clear view and an accessible docking hatch. The final product wound up being a cross between the two accepted concepts. Whilst one on the left looked aerodynamic, it wasn't necessary. Thus, it was opted for the front end of the right, though the cargo pods of the left design one were more ideal for the shot of the Norsican shuttle strafing along the length of the ship, establishing its size. A teaser shot of the ship looking down the main body of it, between the cargo modules, in what Moore described as a Grand Canyon flyby, really helped sell it. Going backwards through the alphabet, we move on to the J-Class. Running 40 meters shorter, but also operating in the 22nd century as part of the Earth Cargo Service, and like the Y-Class, it was often run by families. ECS Horizon was the birthplace of Travis Mayweather, the best pilot you could have for the time, until... Oh hell, I'm the best pilot you could have. Zip it, Locarno. You're not who you say you are. It was not uncommon for the crew to wear several hats, as it were, to keep the ship running. Tinker, tenor, doctor, spy, not the Voyager episode. Hell, cooking for the crew on the reactor probably wasn't even given a second glance. And despite being a little bit shorter, the Class J also topped out at warp 1.8, but usually run at lower speeds to not stress the engines too much. They were again equipped with two plasma cannons and that hardened shell stuff... Electro... Electric fences, yes. The forward section of the J-Class could decouple from the cargo module that it was towing in much the same way the cab of a lorry would detach from its trailer. Once free, the drive section was faster and much more maneuverable, which, yes, makes perfect sense. The bridge was small and rather basic, even by defiant standards, 
Most consoles operated from a standing position. The command chair was at the center of the room, and the helm and navigation console were at the front, and there were multiple stations lining the walls. But seriously, I've seen bathrooms larger than this. I mean, how on earth do the crew keep composure if they're in a tense situation when they are literally jammed in there like sardines? I mean, if you catch my meaning here, there are enough noxious gases running through a ship as is without that many people being squished together in close proximity. While other ships of the class, and indeed the Y class, were often attacked by pirates, disabled, pillaged of their cargo, or worst case scenario, destroyed, although that probably wasn't such a bad thing for people sandwiched into the bridge, Travis wasn't about to let it happen to his home ship. When Horizon came under attack from razors, razors? <sighs> Nauseous razors. Feels like that should be on lower decks. When Horizon came under attack from raiders, he took it upon himself to modify the plasma cannon, which was instrumental in staving off an attack. And the mod remained in place, even after his brother berated him for leaving for Starfleet and living in luxury by comparison. Yeah, because the NX-01 was luxurious. But then walks back in and makes changes as if it was his place. But the intent was more to atone for his leaving, and a desire to share things that he'd learned in his time away. The design of the J-Class was, in fact, taken from one of the rejected concepts of the ECS Fortunate from Enterprise Season 1. So he got his way with having the nacelle at the front of the tug instead of it being an all-in-one ship with the nacelles at the back. The ship was to immediately be recognizable as the same type, a cargo freighter of the ECS, as you would be able to look at a ship with a primary saucer or hull, engineering section, and two nacelles at the back and know it was Starfleet. Even though the script called for the ship to separate, Eves didn't bother to fully design the cab as an individual ship, just a bunch of separation lines, as he was confident that the VFX team could handle it. Next, we roll on to the Arctic One, which was a research ship, also operating in the 22nd, out of Earth Science Institute this time. It had a length of 80 meters and a top speed of warp 1.4, and it carried five crew and a further 25 mission specialists. As a pure research ship operated by a non-military organization, there were no weapons to speak of. Guess what it did have, though? You got it. Electric fences. No, electromagnetic hull plating. Now, in appearance, it resembled a giant snowmobile, which was a bit on the nose, and had three landing skids, allowing it to land on snowy terrain. As the name would suggest, Arctic One was outfitted to operate in extreme cold weather conditions. The cockpit, or bridge, I suppose, was located at the very top of the vessel, and the rest housed science labs and living quarters. A single pilot could fly the ship, but normally operated with a crew of five, while it would accommodate up to 30 in total, depending on mission parameters. Most of the interior was given to the main cargo hold, which carried all of the items such as insulated sleeping modules and drilling equipment that research teams would need to study a frozen world for weeks at a time. The underside of the ship featured several reaction control thrusters, which allowed the ship to hover and take off or land vertically. And at the rear, you found the impulse engines and the warp drive. But let's talk about what happened when the Borg got a hold of one, shall we? In 2153, an archaeology team researched Earth's Arctic Circle and came across what we, the fans, know as the Enterprise's hull section masquerading as a piece of Borg sphere debris. Oh, uh, they also found the Borg, yes. Unaware of how dangerous they were at the time, they thawed out the frozen drones and became promptly assimilated, of course they did, along with their ship and set off in the direction of the Delta Quadrant, a journey with comparatively low speed, even after being Borgified, that would have made Voyager's trip sound like a jolly jaunt to the local corner shop and back. It's funny how scientists first thought of an advanced cybernetic in deep freeze, just dig it up and play with it. I mean, imagine if it had been Starfleet or another military organization. They'd have perhaps been a bit warier to dig it up and maybe lock it up or... Oh, who are we kidding? They probably would have read Shakespeare at it, and then before you know it, you've got Law Mark III. Descent joke. That could have caused issues further down the line, rather than having the Enterprise blow it out of the sky, to be long forgotten until the Enterprise D makes first contact with them. <laughs> but while we're on the subject of Enterprise, to satisfy those who would say they toyed with canon... Don't forget that a Borg Sphere was destroyed over Earth in 2063, meaning the events weren't a, quote, strict progression of cause to effect, 
But actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, time is more like a big ball. <sighs> Are we going to have to get someone from TARDIS Central to explain this? Just accept that things get retconned all the time, please. I'd appreciate it. Anyhow, a perfect segue into the details of the assimilated Arctic One. Way! It had approximately 29 crew. Doesn't sound very approximate. While the base shape was pretty much the same, the Borg modified most of the primary systems, as well as fitting extra hull plating, enhancing the engines because bollocks to trying to go to the Delta Quadrant at warp 1.4. And they fitted weapon nodes to utilize proton-based energy beams and the well-known cutting beam to add technological distinctiveness to their own. The most impressive feat was that in less than 12 hours, the ship's warp engines had been radically upgraded to reach warp 4.98, more than doubling its base capability. In the mere on-screen moments between the first meeting with Enterprise and the next, Arctic One's overall mass had increased by 3%, giving an indication of how fast the ship was evolving. Dr... Ugh, they're just asking me to screw this pronunciation up. Dr. Monica? 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 You know what? I really like friends back in the day. We'll stick with that one. Monica of the A6 evacuation team that set up the lab for where the drones were thawed out. He discovered that the nanotechnology was repairing the bodies and wished to study further in a controlled environment, because <laughs> that always works so well, but he was overruled. His superiors, honestly, should have listened, as chronologically he became the first human ever to be assimilated. It always seems like a good idea after the fact, doesn't it? The only way Enterprise was able to defeat Arctic One was by beaming aboard and setting explosives around the EPS manifold, which upon return to the ship were detonated, but they blew the Borg ship apart, because of course they did. In the aftermath, it was discovered that the ship had sent spatial coordinates of Earth, but it would take some 200 years to reach its destination, or sometime in the 24th century, which is convenient. Its direction? The Delta Quadrant! <laughs> That's called foreshadowing! <laughs> but from the beginning, the Arctic Explorer involved creating two designs, the Expedition version and the Borged Up version. Or as I like to call it, the Bollocked Up version? Ah, too much of a stretch, that one, I suppose. Eves began with the unmodified version and decided it would be a mix of a snowplow, a helicopter, and an Arctic Exploration Vehicle. Basically, a combination of things that would make it appropriate for the job. And up until now, Eves had designed more ships that were taller than they were wide, so he wanted it more horizontal. It was important that it looked suited for traversing and landing on their snowy getaways. Early sketches had the ship armed, but the producers decided it wasn't a good idea. But the Borg never listened to producers. Of course they don't. When it came to modifying it for the assimilated design, it was important for Eves that the audience were able still to recognize it as the same ship, just with more Borg stuff and aesthetics on it, seeing as how quickly it was transforming. So he slapped on some Borg texturing on the front, also called dipping it in superglue and throwing it into a pile of Lego pieces, whilst the rest of the ship underwent a more radical change. The back grows into all kinds of crazy configurations, while the front makes it possible to know what ship you're looking at. We provided drawings for two stages of Borgification. The back was going to be enormous and out of proportion, where it was definitely going to grow into something bigger. Would it interest you to know that initial plans were for it to evolve into another sphere? Yeah, probably a good thing Trip was able to fix their weapons in time to wreck the ship! The Festoon, moving swiftly onwards, was owned by the arms dealer known as Baron Grimes, Harcourt Fenton Mudd's father-in-law <laughs> in the 2250s. The ship was never named on screen, but at the 2018 Fan Expo Canada in Toronto. A super yacht, and one of the most unusual designs we've seen on Star Trek, actually. It's one of the very few civilian ships to appear, and the only one owned by an obscenely wealthy man. Because you can't count Quark, because his shuttle literally blew up in his face. And besides, Quark never actually became filthy rich. But I still love him. He was seen on screen for such a brief time. Uh, the Festoon, not Quark. 
However, we know it's unarmed because it never fired a shot at Discovery, and that makes it true. So there. Designers were directed that the ship be... I'm just going to say it. Trumpian. And that it was an idiot... Uh, <clears throat> over the top, big, ridiculous, and just plain silly super yacht. It even had a bust, or rather a nautical figurehead of sorts, at the bow of the ship. But just to go that much better, he's got the whole damn animal sat there. I mean, what? Why? It is 388.26 meters long, which was established by now veteran Star Trek designer Ryan Denning, who in 2019 took the lead on this one. Denning penned dozens of low-detail sketches, taking elements from one to the next and building on the best bits of the previous, then seeing which one draws in the most eyes. Several of them were given a render with greater detail, such as hull colouring, detailing, and all-around refined presence. It was a hymn to excess, a rich guy's yacht, with interiors inspired by 21st century billionaires. He also did take a look at Trump's yacht and the interiors of Trump Tower, which no doubt gives inspiration to the tower on top. He figured it would have a lot of gilding, a lot of unnecessary stuff to make it look ridiculous. Okay, enough phallic jokes. Oh, maybe one more. He made the nacelles obnoxiously huge and attached to skiff-style pylons a clear connotation for Grimes overcompensating? Yeah, let's say that. Long story short, this ship was created for the purpose of saying, Look, I'm rich and I've got a ship ton of cash. And again, YouTube, I said ship with a P. And it screamed all these things in the briefest of out outrageously short three seconds appearances. Make of that what you will. We now move on to a more ubiquitous design of freighter that seemed to be everywhere. The Antares class, a warp-capable freighter in service as early as the 22nd century, but still built well into the 24th, with some even being constructed at lunar shipyards. The vessels could operate with a complement of 12 crew, protected with standard deflector shields, and some fitted with antiquated Class V transporters, which were unable to transfer unstable biomatter, which would require the crew to use anti-grav sleds to load and unload. What a drag. Oh god, it's another dad joke. I think I must be approaching my record by now. But they were more than capable of hauling various types of freight, including a variety of ores, and these included themselves, but were by no means limited to duridium, inertium, dilithium, and some of the lesser-known elements of unobtainium, transformium, made-upium, get a bit of thatium, and of course the extremely well-known bullshitium, itself a critical component in the manufacture of plot armor. In addition, they would carry a wide range of supplies to and fro, such as medical, materials stipulated by contract. There was a rare element, similarly named duridium, which was transported by one of these freighters to the Kobliad, a dying race which used the element to prolong their lifespan by replenishing their cell structures. There were some Antares-class freighters operated in and by the Federation itself, but there are also ships such as the SS Zosa, which was captained by Cassidy Yates, which operate under the Petarian Authority, or the Bajorans for that matter. Now, her ship equipment was mostly obsolete, provided to her by said authority. Zosa would frequently dock at Deep Space Nine for layovers en route to destinations, collecting cargo, or just generally dropping by for Captain Yates to marry the station commander, Captain Benjamin Sisko, which, you know, why wouldn't you? This incidentally worked in her favor when the Bird of Prey IKS Imchar, which the Pokemon Go enthusiast in me is now insisting we call Chimchar forever, under order of Chancellor Gowron, stopped and attempted to board in search of stowaway changelings, but at the last minute there was another ship coming in. It was the Enterprise. No, the Defiant. Sorry, I'm used to that line going one way. In 2372, Zosa secured a contract with the Bajoran Ministry of Commerce and for cargo runs to outlying Bajoran colonies. The captain and crew of the Zosa were charged with supplying the Maquis with supplies. Yates had used her relationship with Cisco to avoid a health inspection by Security Chief Odo, <laughs> health inspection, stating she had a rendezvous with a Tholian freighter. Ironically, she was caught in her own web. <laughs> of lies, that is. The name Zosa comes from an indigenous tribe in South Africa, known as the Zosa people. In real life, the word starts with a lateral click, not present in English. 
In older Afrikaans, it was written K-U-S-A, with the K approximating the lateral click. According to the script from DS9's episode Family Business, the ship was an independent interstellar freighter, which is not easy to say at all. Running at approximately 270 meters long, the Antares class was an unarmed class of freighter and only capable of low warp speeds. Though there is no doubt there are some out there retrofitted to carry some form of weaponry for the period, the ships were capable of flooding their holds with baryon radiation, which would eliminate viruses and cargo suspected of being contaminated before loading. The Antares had a very distinctive rear end, with three large circular exhaust ports that gave off a red-orange glow when not in use. The model used, and that became the Zosa, began its Star Trek back in the Next Generation episode Heart of Glory as the Battress, which had been taken over by Klingon Renegades. It later returned in symbiosis, named Sanction, painted grey and its hull heavily modified, with numerous extensions to the aft end and cargo containers. That version reappeared as erstwhile, with a greenish hue with its exhausts lighted and windows added to the command section. And the next time it showed up in the next gen, the hull modifications had been removed once again, resembling the Battress as a simple sublight freighter. It of course appears as the Antares class, the aforementioned Norkova, before the Zosa. However, the model was flipped upside down for that class, and the model painted grey. A number of unnamed Antares appeared in DS9, using the brown Zosa variant, giving them a more dated 23rd century look, compared to the later constructed grey-coloured version. The final use of the studio model was used in a Voyager episode, The Shoot, in which it was depicted as an Akrotirian freighter. After this, a CGI version was shown in several other Voy episodes, and then later in Enterprise as a moon freighter. The Zosa was one of the most heavily reused studio models in the entire franchise. So there's some, but definitely not all, of the Civi ships for you. Did you learn anything new? Can you think of any other groupings we should cover, such as Kitbash, Kazon, or even a specific ship we might be able to dig up for some little-known facts on? Also known as stuff you 100% couldn't possibly know without this video? Or shall we just hurl cannon out the airlock and start talking about homebrew content, like my own personal design starship, the Relentless? Uh, maybe not that one. Probably a bad idea. But if you do want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then make sure you hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media or join the community Discord server. But for now, I've been Lieutenant Commander Adam. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends.